So the first thing we have to know about computer networking is what is a virtual machine. It is like a machine, like a laptop, but it's just virtual in that it's in the cloud. Now, when you're creating one in the Azure portal, you can select the size, the disks, the networking, the operating system, etc. Now, this provides infrastructure as a service because it's like getting a laptop, but in the cloud, so it's infrastructure. Now, these are optimized for lift and shift migrations. So if you were to then lift stuff from a data data center, so for a company, and move it into the cloud, you can just re create virtual machines in the cloud that are the same as the on-prem virtual machines. So they're ideal when you want to total control over the operating system, running custom software or hosting configurations. So with virtual machines, you might want to scale them up if you have the demand. Now these can be scaled in two ways, using availability sets or scale sets. The main difference here is that a scale set, it's the same virtual machine scaled out, so it supports auto scaling. So when you want more than one to automatically come in, if you have the demand, and then back down again. On the other side, availability sets, they can have a variety of different sizes, but because of this, there's no auto scaling support. Now also, availability sets, there's no AZ, which is availability zone support, it's only regional. For scale sets, regional or AZ. Now, within your availability set, you can have them within a fault domain and or an upgrade domain. So a fault domain is that your virtual machines within the scale set are within physically distinct parts such that if there was a fault in one, it wouldn't affect the other. So for instance, they could be plugged into different power sockets. Upgrade domain is more of a logical grouping, so they might all be in the same power socket, they might be within the same fault domain, but they're going to be upgraded at different times, such that if, say, Windows roll out an upgrade, it doesn't affect all of your virtual machines at once, that it maybe hits one of them, and that starts upgrading whilst your other ones run in the background. So, when to use your virtual machines during test and dev, when running apps, and when extending your data center, or during disaster recovery. Next up, we have virtual desktop, which is exactly what it sounds. Desktops that you can access virtually, so like this here, Windows, it's that, but you can access it globally, anywhere. And normally you would do that via HTTP or HTTPS, which is just up here, you'd see it if we put it at the beginning. You can see that's just the protocol for the internet. It has an enhanced feature for security because it leverages Microsoft Entra ID, which is like a centralized security thing. You might have heard it be called Active Directory just a centralized way to manage access and security within Azure. Now, you can do MFA and RBAC, which is what enhances the security here. MFA, multi-factor authentication, would be like using your password and an authentication app. RBAC would be role-based access control, which is what it sounds like. You get assigned a role, and that role is the basis for access control. For example, if you have a team of developers, they'll have a specific role, a developer, or a specific subset, so a specific type of role. You only want them to get access to that one bit, give them that role. Additionally, the data and apps are separated from the local hardware. Because virtual desktop is like a virtualized abstraction, your data is not on that machine or on that laptop, it's somewhere else in the data center. Now, with this, it lets you use Windows 10 or 11 Enterprise multi-session, the only Windows client-based OS that enables multiple concurrent users on a single VM. So, it means that multiple people can access this virtual desktop at the same time. Now, next up, a bit of more of an abstraction from machines. We have containers. Now, you can think of containers as a virtual machine without the operating system. That means it's lightweight and designed to be created, scaled out, and stopped dynamically. One of the most popular container engines is Docker. Now, this is generally used to move something or to create a microservices architecture. Now, a monolithic architecture is one big app, for example. A microservices architecture is when you would have different containers or different apps which would be running different things such that they can be updated independently or they can be you know changed etc now within azure we get container instance container apps and kubernetes service container instance is the fastest and simplest way 
in Azure. It is a platform as a service. The container apps is an instance, but with benefits such as ability to incorporate load balancing and scaling it up. Again, that's platform as a service. Kubernetes, which is actually a container orchestration service. Now this helps, it says, manage fleets of containers across the life cycle. So you can imagine it here, you can run an instance, one container, see what happens. Here, you can scale that container out if you need it. Whereas with Kubernetes, it's much more complex and complicated that it can manage the orchestration, which is managing them essentially, loads of containers, scaling and etc. So it's just like a big scaled out version of container apps. Now next up is functions. So this is where we're getting now into serverless stuff. Serverless meaning that you don't have to have specifically or explicitly selected the servers to run things on. You can just automatically in the background it deals with say networking. So where you may have to, in your virtual machine, you have to download Python and you know install stuff, blah, blah, blah. In functions, you could just add the Python code and it would run it, right? So it's event-driven serverless compute. The benefits, you can code quickly, it runs in response to something. So if you have an Azure service, like a monitoring service, and when it notices a specific event, it will then trigger this function to run. Now it scales automatically, it's pay as you go for the CPU that it uses, and it is stateless by default, but it can become stateful. So durable functions using context. So state is essentially, stateless means no memory, stateful means memory. And so you can make your function have memory, like remembering stuff, if you use context. Now, for apps themselves, here are our app hosting options. So we can use Azure App Service for web apps, mobile apps, logic apps, and API apps. Now we can link in directly from the code. So using, for instance, Azure DevOps repos or GitHub, it allows a variety of coding languages to run. Here's just an example of some. And it always allows for Windows or Linux based apps. And so basically for here, you have code and you inject it into Azure App Service via connecting it, such as from GitHub, and it runs your app or hosts your app. 